insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 26, Clueless in Disney. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my, what do we have here? Radiant and <laughs> wonderful co-host, Michelle Whalen. Line, please. <laughs> How are you today, dear? I'm okay. How are you? I'm I'm awesome. So it looks like we have a <coughs> fairly uh, team podcast this week compared to the marathon ones we ran last week. Yes, we do. So uh, in Disney Detective, we have uh, uh, some commentary on childless millennials at Disney. Then we have a follow-up on a previous story about a Spider-Man uh, grave marker. And then we have the unfortunate passing of the voice of Minnie Mouse. Then on to our entertainment news. We have some information on uh, supporting hair dyeing with celebrities. I guess I'll characterize it as that. <laughs> we'll talk more about that. And then Katy Perry and uh, others are paying uh, copyright uh, infringements now. So then we'll get into our insightful picks after that. So are we ready to get going? Let's roll. Let's do it. Go for Disney Detective. So there was a, a funny article that came out uh, this week that was uh, kind of pointing fun at a tweet that had actually gone out. The, the original tweet was actually back in September of last year, where it basically, it was this mother um, of, a, I guess, three-year-old? Yeah, a three-year-old, who basically went on a, a whole tirade and rant about millennials going to Disney. Somebody and ranting at Disney? That never happened. I know. just fist fights these days. <laughs> right, that's true. You know, and she goes on to say about, you know, childless couples shouldn't go to Disney World, that it's for families with kids, and that, you know, you're, you're making the lines longer, and I'm not able to get my Mickey Mouse pretzel because you're buying up all the snacks. You know, and, and you know, she goes on this whole rant, and you know, then there was, you know, a whole bunch of people that were like, oh, my God, this is my new favorite, you know, mommy post. I'm that millennial who is making your kids cry, you know, at Disney. Yeah, mission accomplished. <laughs> so this one person, you know, wrote this article saying that childless millennials aren't the problem. It's clueless parents that are. And... Um, you know, and the the person that, that wrote this article, you know, goes on to, to talk about that, you know, if you're waiting online for three hours for a ride, you're the one that's causing this problem. You know, it, it, your screaming child, you know, is, is screaming because nobody should wait online for, for three hours for anything. Um, and it basically goes on to talk about how, you know, planning a trip to, to Disney really is almost a military operation that you need to take the time to plan to get your fast passes to, you know, to do your dining reservations and, and, you know, you know, plan out your your day, especially when you have young children, if you know that they need to take naps at certain times. And if you, you know, uh, you know, if they they won't stand online for for longer than, you know, a half hour, then don't get on that line. Um, so, you know, it was kind of funny, you know, that the person that wrote the article said that, you know, that their family, you know, went on a trip, they had planned things out. 
And you know what? The millennials didn't bother them because they were doing their thing. The family was doing their thing. Um, <laughs> they said that they also saw parents that, that their kids were miserable and they kind of felt bad when, you know, you're waiting on a, a, a line for Seven Dwarfs Mine Train that's a three hour wait when the ride is only a three minute wait who yep. who's the you know who's the idiot then and they, and they said something about you know that when they got on you know the fast pass line you know don't make eye contact don't make eye contact because you didn't you felt bad for the parents you know that are sitting there and i know we've kind of had that too where you know we had a fast pass for something we're like doo, 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 doo. you know you kind of feel cool like yeah i'm one of the cool kids i'm not waiting and you are ha 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 well, you know, so. and, and I like how it's it's sort of poking fun at this mm-hmm. woman and her tirade, but right. really the problem isn't with the millennials, no. nor is it with this mother. The problem is with Disney. Right. Disney should not, you know, I've said for the longest time that there isn't a single ride in Disney that's worth a three-hour wait. Mm-hmm. The fact that or a they two allow, hour, or an hour wait even the fact that they allow a line mm-hmm. to get that long is shameful on right. Disney's mm-hmm. part. No, and we've you talked should, about that you before. You should cut the ride. You should have a certain amount of time that you allow people to wait in line and cut the line at that point and don't even let people stand mm-hmm. in line. Let that line cut down, then you open it back up and you let people mm-hmm. in. Or you do like what Dumbo does. Where they have a reservation type thing, where they have a play area that the kids can go and play, and then you have a buzzer that goes off when it's your sure, time. Sure, and I'm okay with that. What I'm not okay with is what they did with Winnie the Pooh, or what they did with Peter Pan, or what they did with Haunted Mansion, where they make the line the line an, attraction. A, an interactive like only attraction. Disney can get away with making standing in line an attraction. Because it's literally that bad. I mean, the the parks, if you've got that many people in your park standing in line for that long, you've got too many people in your park. Hmm. You need to cut down. And it's it's all about money, obviously. Obviously. You need to cut down the number of people that you allow in your park at a time. Or you need to provide better accommodations for these people. You need to provide more fast passes. The fact that I can go to, to Magic Kingdom... And I can only get three fast passes, which I can get more after I use those up. Mm-hmm. But you really you can't because no fast passes are generally available. After right, that depending point. on how early your you know, fast passes are. And stuff. Let yeah. me deal mm-hmm. with my rides like reservations at a restaurant. Mm-hmm. Let me make reservations. I can only make one an hour. Okay, right. one I can an see hour that. is fine. But I should be able to make reservations for that all the way through. Mm-hmm. And if you do that. Then you can ensure you've got enough people running the rides. You've got maintenance on site in case you don't have, uh, uh, in case you have breakdowns on the rides. If you do have breakdowns on the rides, you know who you have to notify, when you have to notify them through the app. Mm-hmm. Like it, it shouldn't have to be like planning a military operation. Right. No. Disney makes it's, it that way. It's become that way. It, right. It's definitely become that way. But the other thing too is, you know, for people that are waiting online for that many hours, that's that many hours less that they could, you know, be spending money on food or Absolutely. snacks or things because you're in a line, you can't do anything now. Um, what was it? Uh, rock and roller coaster. They were kind of besides when they did um, Dumbo with the the little wait time. They were actually the first ride where they kind of did that same thing where they gave you like a reservation time. It wasn't a fast pass. It was instead of you waiting online for so many hours throughout yeah. a queue, they gave you a thing, and they actually modified that whole area so there's a dj playing music there's a couple of food vendors so that yeah you could actually do something so that you get online maybe 40 minutes before your ride or a half hour right you know beforehand that's, that's perfectly normal so you you let your lines get to a certain point, and after that, you go to a reservation system. Right, and that would make total sense. And I could totally see them doing that, you know. And, you know, it blows my mind because Disney, from a logistical standpoint, are brilliant mm-hmm. in almost every other respect. Mm-hmm. Except yeah. for handling lines in their parks. And their lines in their parks are notoriously long. Right, right. 
and all the rides end in gift shops too, which are just <laughs> kind of just, insulting. Yeah, well, that's just Disney for you. So, all right, that's also I'm going to bash Disney today, right? Okay. No, well, no, no maybe no, another one, one more. Okay, one more. <laughs> all right, another one. So uh, the next one is a, a follow up to a story we talked about a couple of weeks ago um, about. Um, a four-year-old boy who had passed away and his father had wanted to put Spider-Man on his headstone and Disney basically denied it, saying it was actually, you know, a rule that had been passed down from Walt Disney himself where he said, you know, the likeness of any character, you know, wouldn't be allowed. Um, So what actually happened was the father made a temporary plastic headstone with spider-man on it and had it up in the cemetery and the cemetery um found out about it and actually had him remove it because again it was against the cemetery's rules as well as the issue with with disney um as as well um So the father had said, we had put up a temporary grave last week. I loved it, and I'm sure my son did too. But since the temporary stone still went against both Disney and the cemetery's usage rights and policies, Lloyd said that the temporary stone was short-lived. The council told us to take it down as soon as they found out. They told us we couldn't have it. Um, So he, you know, went on to say that it's obviously been a very stressful time because of, you know, the loss of his son. Um, and that it was just something that he did to kind of make himself, you know, deal through through this pain. But the interesting thing is that a U.S. copyright lawyer has since reached out to the family, offering to take Disney on pro bono in an attempt to get Ollie's gravestone approved. Lloyd said, my brother got a letter um, through um, uh, th- from a lawyer and... It seems that he's taken on Disney before and he's won. He goes, I don't know exactly how it works, but it's nice that there are support. Um, So since the news broke um, of Disney denying the family the request to use the image on the gravestone, more than 140,000 people have signed a petition asking Disney to reconsider. And obviously Disney has not responded to the petition yet. And, you know, you already know how I feel about Mm -hmm. this. I think Disney is is doing a disservice to their fans, to their brand, to their company, Mm -hmm. and to the memory of this little boy. Now, with that said, having seen what that temporary headstone looked like, I think there's a better way to have gone about this than to do something as blatant as that. Right. I think something could be done that's more tasteful with, mm-hmm. like, the Spider-Man symbol engraved right. on it or, or like something like that. Or just, like, the Spider-Man logo right. or something, something like that would be small perfectly and fine and yeah. tasteful. And I think if you went about it that way, you might have an argument at that point in time mm-hmm. that you could take that petition to Disney. I think, right. I think the problem is they kind of force the issue now. Right. And, you know, you're not going to... to Strong arm Disney, you're just not going to, and, and you're not going to win, right? And you can try. Kudos and, to this lawyer for taking it on pro bono, but I don't think they have a, any ground to stand on here, right? And the thing is, you know, there. If you you know do a, a search online, you can find exotic and weird headstones that people have had made for themselves or for family members, you know, or big giant. You know, I think there was one where it was like. They had their Cadillac, you know, made into a headstone, right. and all these obscure things. And, you know, and there have been not cartoon characters, but, you know, like teddy bears and cats and, and things like that. And honestly, I could totally see how unfortunate it is. You know, you can get almost any product with some sort of Disney character slapped on it. And if you do, you're usually paying a premium for right. it. You know, like well, and you don't even have to go that route here. You could do a stylized version of the Spider-Man symbol, mm-hmm. which, you know, yeah. Granted, Disney owns the Spider-Man symbol, but if you stylize it and it, you just make it look like a spider, right? You accomplish your goal. Yeah, I could see and that you if you kind of modify, law. you know, take part, you know, t- take some of the artwork and and change it. Like I had a, a bracelet made and i had 
quote unquote Mickey ears put on it. Right. And of course, it's not, you know, Disney sanctioned or, or whatever. And it's their modified version of mouse ears. So that's how they can get away with it. So I'm sure, right. again, something like that. I think they kind of did themselves a disservice yeah, with this one here, especially with the amount of publicity they got. Mm-hmm. But again, you know, Disney is being completely unreasonable in this. Disney should be coming back with options on what they can do. Right. And there's absolutely no reason why you can't put a spider on a sto- on a tombstone. Mm-hmm. Disney doesn't own the copyright on all pictures of spiders. Right. So it's easy to get around that. Right. You know, they need to be a little bit more creative and a little bit less brazen, I think, in order to accomplish what they're looking to do. Yeah. So, all right. I'm not going to bash Disney too much on that one. Though. Okay. I bashed them enough already on that. <laughs> We're going to have to only, rename this segment the Disney <laughs> Disaster, not the Disney Detective. <laughs> Disney detective with bashing, Uh, optional. (laughs) So we have one more story? One more sad Disney story. Um, So last Friday, the voice of Minnie Mouse, uh, Russie Taylor, passed away. Um, And the article that I actually found was was actually more of a a romantic tale. It was uh, titled, She Was the Voice of Minnie Mouse, He Was the Voice of Mickey Mouse, and That's How Their Romance Began. Um, So the voice of Mickey and Minnie for years, um, or I should say the voice of Mickey Mouse uh, up until recently had been voiced by um, Wayne all wine um and he had actually been doing the voice for about 10 years or so before uh russie taylor actually got hired to do the voice um she actually won the role in 1986 beating out more than 150 other actors for the role and the following year she was on the voiceover stage uh for a disney special called totally mini when she got to meet Wayne Allwine, um, who had inherited the role of Mickey Mouse, like I said, about a decade earlier. And he was actually only the third person, including Walt Disney, to actually do the voice of Mickey. Um, So they started working together, and that's when Sparks kind of flew. Um, They were Mickey and Minnie, um, quoted from Bill Farmer, who was newly cast as Goofy at the time. He said it was typecasting. Taylor, who was then in her mid-40s, was remembered by friends and acquaintances as a sweet person with a great sense of humor. She was outgoing and warm and always a joy to work with and always uh, taking joy in what she worked on. Um, And it goes on to talk about how they, you know, at the time when they started working as Mickey and Minnie, they were actually both married to other people um, and uh, kind of both in in bad marriages. uh, And over the years, they both actually got divorced from their respective spouses. And then not long later, actually. Oh, what a nice Disney story. (laughs) Broke up two marriages. But then they fell in love and they got married. Um, They actually got married in 1991 uh, in Hawaii. And they they tried to keep their their personal life private um, because they didn't want their marriage to kind of cloud over Mickey and Minnie because Mickey and Minnie never officially got married. Um, so there they was lived a, in sin they, all this time. Well, no, they never lived in sin because they had their own house. Mickey and Minnie never lived together. Oh, they never lived together? No, they never uh, lived together. Don't you remember Toontown? Before no, I, I it got, just, yeah, you know. I know, whatever. I, I just assume all like happy stories <laughs> like that turn out bad with all Disney stars. <laughs> right. So once radio host Paul Harvey had actually asked him to share a romantic story about themselves and they actually refused saying that it it would have drawn the spotlight away from their characters and that was really the main focus of that's cool that they were that dedicated to the yeah, characters yeah um, you know so they always you know enjoyed being together uh, in some joint interviews um, All Wine who was actually also an Emmy award winning sound and sound effects editor uh, would serenade Taylor in character. So he'd be singing in, you know, Mickey Mouse's voice and he'd always bring a ukulele and kind of play a cute little song saying how much, you know, he loved her, you know, in Mickey's voice to, to Minnie. Right. Um, So it it was just, 
you know, very sweet, um, you know, that they had, you know, such a, a beautiful love story brought about by, you know, Mickey and Minnie. Um, unfortunately, uh, he passed away in May of 2009. Um, and it was actually a year after they were both inducted um, as Disney legends. And he had voiced Mickey's uh, Mickey Mouse for 32 years at that point. Wow. Um, so after Wayne passed away, she obviously, you know, continued to talk about him and, you know, was always in, you know, her heart. Um, and she actually had met Walt Disney years ago, uh, at the Anaheim Park as a child. Um, she actually voiced, besides Minnie Mouse, she had actually voiced, uh, other characters like Strawberry Shortcake, Baby Gonzo from Muppet Babies, um, the nephews from from the original DuckTales. Um, but then once she voiced Minnie, that was really who, you know, she who she was. And he, at that yeah, point. she became, um, you know, uh, the, the family friend said that when they were together, they were like, they were like Laurel and Hardy. They were just meant to be together as a team and as a lifelong team. If you looked in Webster's and saw the word marriage, you would see a picture of Wayne and Russie. Uh, they were just so in love and so wonderful together, and that came through in their performance and gave it a little something extra. Well, that's cute. Yeah, so that was sweet. Well, that's a shame. Mm-hmm. So, that's all we have for Disney Detectives. That is it for Disney Detectives. All righty. So, moving right on to our entertainment news this week. Uh, we have pink in the news here. Tell us about that one. So there was a story that came out that said, uh, that talked about pink, the musical performer. Uh, she dyed her daughter's hair in support of Jessica Simpson, who had been mom shamed because she colored her daughter's hair. So what had happened was Jessica Simpson dyed her daughter's hair and she just dyed the tips. Um, her daughter is seven. Um, dyed the tips purple and posted it on Instagram and had all of these people go after her saying, oh my God, what a horrible person you are. She's too young to have her hair dyed. You know, all these different things, mom shaming. So Pink said, you know what? I'm going to dye my daughter's hair in, you know, in support and solidarity. Right. Um, so the pop star, uh, who's 39, shared a photo on Thursday of her daughter, Willow, who is eight, getting her hair dyed blue after she had heard about the backlash that Jessica Simpson received for letting her daughter, Maxie, dye the ends of her hair. Uh, she said, I heard, uh, so Pink said, I heard people were bummed on Jessica Simpson for letting her seven year old get hair color. Pink wrote in her Instagram caption, which comes just two days after Simpsons has posted her pictures. So we thought we'd share what we did yesterday. Uh, and in the photo, you see Pink, who is actually doing the dye job herself. Um, and, you know, said... There's an irony that she didn't dye it pink. <laughs> right, it is kind of funny. And she's, and, you know, with the hashtag of blue hair, don't care. Get your own kids. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> um, the singer songwriter actually also disabled the comments on her posts, so this way trolls couldn't, you know, get their way and express any negative views about her parenting. She also included the hashtag, oh, look, Ma, no comments, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Um, so Simpson had shared. Uh, Maxie's new hairdo on Instagram on Tuesday, and it was actually inspired by one of the characters from Descendants. Um, and critics, you know, again, were, oh, you're ruining her hair. She's too young. Why start ruining it so long? Da, 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 da. Again, on and on. Um, but one of the nice things was there were a couple of hairstylists, famous hairstylists, who actually responded and said how wonderful it looked. Great job. And even the official Descendants Instagram account weighed in saying looking good with hearts nice you know so it was nice that that they came they came back um so this just kind of hit home because as you know not only do i put funky colors in my hair but 
I dye our daughter's hair as well. And we started out with just doing little tips. And I don't know, it's probably been a few years now that that we've done it. And, you know. Well, and the the initial dyeing uh, techniques that you used were not using any kind of real... Right. We were using, you were using Kool-Aid. We were using Kool-Aid. And, you know, and again, we were only doing the tips. I, you know, I wasn't doing anything drastic. And if you look at the, the picture, you know, with, you know, of Jessica Simpson's daughter, she only did the tips also. It wasn't like she put the chemicals on the scalp or right. or anything. And now they have so many different hair colors out there that are safe, that aren't these harsh you know, chemical treatments. Well, you know, what blows my mind is she's a horrible person for dyeing her kids hair. <laughs> right. But you can have the President of the United States insult an entire city of people by calling them animals and subhumans. Right. And somehow... That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Right, right. So I think people really need to get the priorities straight here. Yeah. So th- this was, you know, kind of, kind of, like I said, as a as a mother who dyes her daughter's hair and, you know, our daughter even asked, hey, mom, when are you going to dye my hair again? Because her hair still is pink from the last time I dyed it. It's just faded. And it's like, all right, all right school's getting ready to start up. You want some fresh color in your hair? Who am, who am I to say no when I have an appointment tomorrow to go color my hair? So well, when are you going to color my hair? <laughs> when you grow some hair. Oh, okay. well, I can do your beard. We, maybe, could, we could do little bits of like maybe, pink in your beard. Maybe you can just like draw on my scalp here or something. <laughs> Not in a Sharpie or anything. <laughs> that would look funny. So, yeah. So that was, you know, more power to the moms. Dye your, dye your kids' hairs. You know what? Let your kids can. express themselves. Exactly. Exactly. You, know, you can't. All you're going to do is, is, you know, make them, make them grow and let them express their mm-hmm. creativity. Yeah. Uh, and let them be who they want to be. Who the hell cares what these these trolls on the internet think about Absolutely. what you're doing? You know, you can't let that stop you from, mm-hmm. from doing what you want to do. Yep. So what else we got? So our last story of the day is actually uh, from another musician, Katy Perry. Um, And others have to pay nearly $2.8 million from the Dark Horse lawsuit. Uh, So Katy Perry and her production partners will have to pay a copyright infringement case over her 2013 song Dark Horse. And what was funny was I actually heard on the radio because they played like a clip of both songs. And like I kind of heard it, but I really didn't. It didn't you know, really sound that much similar, but obviously a federal jury in Los Angeles on Thursday decided that the music that the group must pay nearly $2.8 million in damages to Flame, whose real name is Marcus Gray, because they determined parts of Dark Horse closely resembled Joyful Noise, which was a Christian rap song of Gray's from 2008. Uh, the jury determined that 22.5% of the profits from Dark Horse were owed to Joyful Noise. Um so basically, it, it's kind of spread out among what everybody has to pay. So Katy Perry, she's going to have to pay $550,000. Her record label, Capitol Records, is going to have to pay one point three. Then the five collaborators on the song were also ordered to pay. So Max Martin, uh, who owes $253,000. Then you have Dr. Luke, who has to pay $61,000. But then his company owes one hundred and ninety eight thousand dollars so so what bean counter comes up with the percentages of these (laughs) i i don't know Uh, maybe how much each person got i don't know it was just kind of like how do you know how much each person contributed yeah i i I don't know so uh perry are you you paying by like the note or by the (laughs) word or what (laughs) how long each well you know so Katy perry actually had made almost 2.5 million in profit so maybe that has something to do with it just from that song just from that song according to court filings uh of the case the nine person jury reached a unanimous decision in the case on monday uh her attorney said that the pop star would actually appear try and appeal um, Perry's attorney argued in part that the portion in question uh, was too high, uh, was too common and too brief to be protected by copyright, uh, Rolling Stone actually reported. Flame 
uh, the artist uh, argued that Dark Horse infringed on his copyright by using an underlining beat from his song without permission. Wow. Um, and I go back to the Vanilla Ice days. Mm-hmm. Well, and where it was just sheer pure ripoff. You well, know? and that's the thing is that this case now joins other har- uh, you know high high profile copyright battles. Um, the far the family of Marvin Gaye, who died in 1984, went after Robin Thick. Uh, Robin Thicke, sorry, along with Pharrell Williams off of um, the 2013 song Blurred Lines because they were saying part of that and... Apparently they didn't blur the lines <laughs> They enough. didn't blur it as much. And that went back and forth for a couple of years and it was actually last year after a five-year battle that Marvin Gaye's family actually won $5 million from it. So... It- Am I the only one that finds it ironic that Katy Perry is tied up with a, a Christian rap group? <laughs> that just seems strange to me. Yeah, and 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 that's the thing is, you know, if she's riding with other people, who's to say, you know, okay, if they happen to hear a song that, oh, you know what, we can use that beat, you know, maybe it wasn't even her that that well, came and, in, and, and like, and that's the thing. Yeah, in, it in is copyright. Kinda... Is it like? Did I steal your beat, or did you inspire me to write something similar? Right. That was almost as much as when John Fogarty was in court being sued for copyright infringement by the other members of CCR Mm -hmm. for a song he himself wrote. Right. And he explained that it wasn't the same song. It It was a different guitar riff. He took his guitar out on the stand and right. played the two different guitar riffs to show the difference. Right. And the judge ruled in his favor. So it's like, all right, I, I guess if you can sue me for my own work, then I'm right. infringing my own work. Right. Then let then me. You can, you can sue for anything these days. It's, yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. So. All right. So that's all we have for entertainment news. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll come back with our insightful picks of the week. And I turn it over to you, my dear. So I, it was kind of funny because I had a hard time <laughs> thinking of what my insightful pick w- was going to be. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, oh, this is what it should be. Even though you knew weeks ago that this was the one you were going to do. Right. And I just totally like blanked out. And so here we are. So um, it is a horror show called, called Nosferatu. And it's actually spelled N O S. Four A two, so it's actually a license plate that's part of the show. So that's why. How it's creative. Cool. Anyway, um, so the first episode aired on June second of this year. It was on AMC, and there were ten episodes in the season. It's actually based on a book by Joe Hill um, of the same name. So Joe Hill's story creates a new take on the vampire tale. The world is introduced to Vic McQueen, who is played by Ashley Cummings, and the evil Charlie Manx, who is played by Zachary Quinto. And Vic has a gift where she can find things. So she rides on her motorcycle, she pictures an item, and then crosses the shorter way bridge, and then all of a sudden she's kind of teleported to where this item would be. Um, As she begins to discover her power, she runs into this evil man named Charlie Manx, who also has an evil power. Manx actually feeds off of the energy of children as he locks them in his evil black 1938 Rolls-Royce Wraith. And then after Manx drains the energy from the children, he drives them to Christmas Land, which is a twisted place in his mind where Christmas is every day. Um, So Vic will do whatever it takes to fight Manx and try and save children before she loses everything. Um, So again, kind of different vampire thing because... You know, he's using the energy, you know, he kind of starts out as an old man and the car and and himself have this interaction. So like when the car is being taken care of or when the car gets this special fluid uh, 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 fuel, he all of a sudden becomes a younger version of himself. But yet if the car gets destroyed or hurt in any way, he becomes this old, decrepit. So much different take on energy vampires than the things we do in the shadows. (laughs) Absolutely. Much, much different. Um, 
And actually, what was really cool was it was announced at Comic-Con that it will be returning for a second season. So no release date has been announced, but it will continue the story from his book. Um, so I look forward to, to seeing uh, the second season. And if it sounds like something you might be interested in, it's only 10 episodes. Um, so it's 11 hours total because the... Um, season finale was actually a two-hour part. So this so. is just one book it's based on, right? There isn't a series? You know what? I'm not sure. I didn't I didn't look to see, because okay. it'll be kind of interesting, because it did say that it was still going to follow the book, so I don't know if this was, you know, only part of it, or if there is, you know, yeah, a series. Yeah, because I, I know a lot of these book-inspired series tend to be book series. Right. Um, you know, Game of Thrones, The Expanse, stuff like that. And the books themselves tend to give you the out if the series gets canceled. Right. You know, at the end of each season, there there tends to be a, a, a finale type thing there. So uh, I, I was curious to know whether or not it had more than one book in the series to get an indication of how far that's the TV series is, is going to go. Yeah, as far as I know, it is just one one book, it looks like. Interesting. Cool. So AMC is bringing uh, literature to the TVs again for horror. <laughs> yep. <laughs> awesome. All right. Good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is not really a documentary, <laughs> okay? You laugh, but don't laugh, okay? Well, I only laugh because I walked in on you watching it today and went, what? And then you said, so, this All right. Is... So before I even all introduce right, it, let me take a step quiet. back, okay? So years ago, ESPN used to play the Strongest Man competitions. And they would travel around the world, and you would have these power lifters who would compete in these various games. And they would do different things that were regionalized. You'd be towing uh, tractor trailers, or you'd be lifting stones, mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever it is. And they would compete in this in a, in a tournament environment, and you'd work towards the championship. And every year they would they would crown a world's strongest man. So this is kind of a takeoff on that. So this is the strongest man in history, <laughs> and it's on the History Channel. It premiered uh, a few weeks back. Uh, it's on Wednesdays at ten Eastern um, on the History Channel, and I'll just read the intro here, and then I'll expound. Uh, the legendary feats of strongmen have been celebrated throughout time, but just how true are these fabled acts? After years of competing as rivals, the four strongest men in the world are teaming up to find out. Eddie Hall, Brian Shaw, Nick Best, and Robert, Robert Oberst travel the world investigating strongman legends and taking on epic feats of strength in a quest to prove who really is the strongest man in history. In each episode, the four strong men take on three strength challenges from history and try to beat the legend and each other. They separate fact from fiction, replicating legendary lifts to determine what they actually weighed while competing to see who among them is the strongest. So the interesting thing about this is... It's not just a bunch of muscle-bound guys trying to compete against each other to see who has the most testosterone. There is that in the show. I, right, I won't, I won't right. deny that. I was going to say. But what they do is each show is themed. And what they do in these themes is they go back and they look at sometimes mythical, really, feats of strength. Okay. Uh, one happened to be Vikings. It was all Viking-themed. So they would do things that legendary Viking warriors did. One was, you know, a... a an attempt to lift this uh, massive log that was in the legend. It was a mast of a ship that was lifted. And, you know, basically he's putting this thing on your shoulders at 1,400, 1,500 pounds or whatever it is. It's just superhuman feats. So there's question of whether or not they actually happened historically or could happen historically. Okay. So you learn a little bit of history about this stuff. Um, and you learn a, a little bit of contemporary information too. Like the one episode was all about the Highland games. Now we know the Highland games are real. They happen every year. Mm -hmm. World records are set. There are legitimate feats of strength at these Highland games. Mm -hmm. So in going to the Highland games, they pick a legendary competitor from the 1800s that they're going to 
perform his feats and do it. And there are documented world records. In fact, the, the one uh, carrying of these particular stones across the bridge it was done by so few people, it's still recorded in this book. And if you even lift these stones, because they've got metallic handles on them, and, and I, I don't know what the weight was off the top of my head, but just the act of lifting them, not even moving them, mm -hmm. is so difficult that you can get your name in the record book for Oh, it. wow. And what's fascinating is... In watching this, these guys are breaking these world records that have stood for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and nobody else has been able to do these hmm. things because it's stuff that they don't normally do in their in their training. Okay. Uh, the episode that I watched uh, when you popped down mm -hmm. was a whole episode uh, on, on an English strongman competitor. Okay. And they recreated a couple of his lifts. One was one of the things that he used to do. He was, you know, around in the 1700s, he owned his own pub. And to entertain people in his pub, he would take the pewter dishes that they serve the food on and he'd roll them up like a newspaper. Okay. Um, so they tried that and it was it was child's play for these guys. They literally rolled these things up like they were, they were paper. Oh, wow. So they upped the ante a little bit and gave them <laughs> frying pans. Oh god. <laughs> like heat cured hardened frying pans. Okay. And they had the competition was who could roll it the tightest. And all four of them were able to take these frying pans and literally roll them up like burritos. Oh god. <laughs> um which is just insane that you'd be able to do that. Right, right. And the last thing that they did was there was a keg lift. So there was an apparatus and that was that what was, I saw. That was what you saw. There was an apparatus that originally uh, held just kegs of beer or whiskey or whatever. And it was like 1,432 pounds, I think, was what the record was. Well, two of these guys wound up getting into this little personal competition. The final lift was well over 2,000 pounds oh. that these guys were able to lift. And, and it looked easy to them. Right, right. So the show itself is cool because... It it kind of springboards on the strongman competitions and gives you a historical account of what it meant to be a strongman through history. Okay. You get to see some of these exotic locations because they go on location for each of them. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's just comical. Like for the England one, you know, you see these guys get on an airplane <laughs> and then they get on a train <laughs> and then they cram <laughs> in the back of a, a, a London cab. You uh huh. Know? Just seeing how guys this size have to negotiate real life things. Right, right. You know, like I'm a big guy and I have issues getting on planes and stuff like that. I'm nothing compared to these guys. So mm. it gives me a whole new appreciation for the fact that, you know, I fit in places a lot better than these guys. Right, do. right. Uh, but That's it also funny. reminded me of, of what it was like when I went over to England for business mm -hmm. and couldn't fit through doors because they weren't wide enough for me to get my shoulders right, through. Right, right. Uh, so, but Strongest Man in History, Wednesdays at 10 on the History Channel. Uh, that's all I had. Did we have afterthoughts? Nope. No, no afterthoughts today. So, I think that's all we had today. Mm hmm. Um, I guess we'll be back next week. Did you want to throw anything out there? One thing I did want to mention uh, it'll show up, should show up in our show notes, and it shows up in the credits. Uh, we've moved over to. Uh, bit.ly for our source links now. So the links themselves are a little bit shorter, a little bit more manageable now. <laughs> uh, so feel free to use those if you want to check out any of the sources from today's um, articles. And that's it. That is it. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. Take care.